Very happy you're here today. It is a beautiful day, absolutely gorgeous, and you are rather nice looking yourself. Let me look you over. I think that's enough. Okay. I enjoyed it while it lasted. Well, I, uh, we have clocks up here on the pulpit. Pastor apparently has never noticed that. Um, I'd like to point that out to him. <laughs> and I was a little worried about my sermon being too long uh, today, and I always worry about things like that. And I told my wife, I'm a little worried it's maybe a little too long. She said, uh, I've heard you preach for almost 49 years. You've never preached a sermon that's too long. Could you believe she said that? She's, that was, she's delusional, obviously. But that was about the sweetest thing uh, she could. She could, she's a keeper, I'll tell you. And then she sits out there and listens to me preach twice. Sometimes preach, teach Sunday school, and preach again on, on Sunday morning. So she has other problems. She just can't get enough of me. I love it. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Hey, did you know today is uh, a very special day. It is National Grandparents Day. It is. It's national. We'd like to recognize and honor all of our grandparents today. And in the first service, it seemed the overwhelming majority were uh, a bucket of… No, no, uh, were… Um, I don't know if you heard what was said this week. Uh, I won't go there. But uh, the majority were grandparents. I couldn't believe it. I, I'd like for all grandparents, grandfathers, grandmothers to stand right now. Let's look and see how many are here today. Wow. Ho! Oh, look at that. Now, stay standing. Now, if you took all those grandparents out of this church, you see what would be left. It would be, uh, it would be a, a terrible hit for the church to take. So, we love you, grandparents. We thank God for you, and you are living a wonderful life and leaving a wonderful legacy for so many. So, we thank you and praise God for you. Uh, I'd like to do just a little quick run-by for us, grandparents in particular. Which grandparent here has the cutest grandchild? Raise your hand. That's what I thought, just uh, about the same number of people that just stood. All right. Who would have the most grandchildren? Is anybody here, any grandparent, you have a hundred grandchildren. Can I see you? Okay, how about uh, how many would have twelve, at least twelve grandchildren? A good number of you. Your life is so full and so blessed. Anybody have 15 or more grandchildren? Okay. 18. 18 grandchildren or more? Still hands are going up. Wow. And how about 20? 20 grandchildren or more? All right. Keep your hands up. 20 or more. You're not getting anything. We just want to know. Well, you know, we're curious. That's all. We're just curious. How about 22? 22 grand. Wow. 22 right here and right there, 24. 24. I feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> Sold to this couple. 24? You have 24? 25. 25? We got a tie here for 24. All right. Well, God bless you. Yeah. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply. Now, there's a reason for that. These kids or pay, growing up, and they're paying into Social Security. So it's a good thing. Keep having them. That's wonderful. And how about, who would have the newest grandchild? We had one in the early service, a grandchild two days old. Anybody have a grandchild six months or younger? Six months or younger. Okay, a lot of you. I see several hands. How about three months or younger? Three months or younger. Right here, right there. Okay. One month? One month or younger? Oh, my. Congratulations, Grandpa. God bless you. God bless your family. And then uh, how about the oldest? The oldest grandchild. Anybody have a grandchild that… Let's pick that number again because it's a round number, 100. Anybody have a grandchild that's 100? 
All right. How about, let's back it off a little bit. How about 35? Grandchild, 35? 35 or older? Yes, you're confused. Okay. I think he negated that hand raise. And if, there you go, right back there. God bless you guys. And right here. Okay, wonderful. Now, last category. Who has the rowdiest grandchild? Yeah, okay. I get it. I get it. We just want to say thank you, Grandpa, Grandma, not only for what you mean to us as a church, but what you mean to family, what you mean to society. And uh, we're, we're just so grateful that you are a very powerful presence in our lives. God bless you. I'm going to talk from jo uh, Joshua chapter 14 this morning, Joshua the 14th chapter, uh, verse 6, reading from the NIV, but I do prefer the King James Bible in this particular instance, but the NIV is at hand. Let's read from it, chapter 14, verse 6. The people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea about you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old, and I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country. The King James Bible says, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there, their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as He said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Well, as I indicated, today is National Grandparents Day. It's the first Sunday after Labor Day. It's been on the national calendar since 1978, though seldom recognized. The founder was Marion McQuaid of Oak Hill, West Virginia, and her goal was to educate the young about the important contribution seniors have made throughout history. And oh, there's a litany of contributions made by those who are quite elderly in life, but we won't take time to go there today. We want to stay here in our text. And today I want to speak to our grandparents, but certainly not only to grandparents. I'm going to speak to all seniors, you know, archaeological relics, prehistoric remnants, the old folks. Old, by the way, if you don't know the definition of old, here it is, and, it's, and it stands. It will always be this. Old is anyone older than I am. You have the definition. But not only to older folks that we love, respect, and revere. I want to speak to everyone and anyone who, well, who is uh, getting older. Anyone who has birthdays. And what better character and person and personality to think of than this man, Caleb. The last time I preached on Caleb, I was 40 years old, 40 years old, a couple years ago, 
like 28 to be exact, and I remember preaching about him, and I was fascinated by this character of the Old Testament. But fascinated doesn't quite do it today. Today I am inspired by him, invigorated by the spirit of this man, Caleb. And I consider him a model and a mentor. I don't care how old you get. You still need heroes, people who inspire you and challenge you and call you to higher ground. The fact is, something or somebody is going to shape my attitude, and it may be my flesh and my feelings, it may be my genetic predispositions, it might be other people, it might be the headlines and the trends of the day. It might be Wolf Blitzer or Bill O'Reilly. It might be Hillary or the Donald. Uh, God help us. God, God help us, please. But what if it's God's Word and God's Spirit that adjusts my attitudes and defines my disposition and informs my interpretation of life's events? Oh, when that happens, when it is God, God's Spirit, God's Word, watch out. Here comes another Caleb. Here comes a mountain climber. Here comes a mountain mover. Now, I trust we will be inspired by Caleb's example. First of all, Caleb was optimistic in his outlook, optimistic in outlook. Now, at age 40, that faith produce optimism is a matter of record, and we see that here in our text. Go back, if you would, to verse 7, and in a reflective moment, Caleb takes us back 45 years to when he was 40 years old. He said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, I brought him back a report. According to my convictions, my fellow Israelites went up with me, made the hearts of the people melt in fear. But I followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have fo followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So the story went like this. Moses sent out 12 spies, one from each tribe, Caleb being one of them, to spy out the land of Canaan and bring back a report to Moses. And Moses gave them quite a checklist. He said, now as you go, I want you to find out what are the people like there? Are they strong or are they weak? Are there many of them or a few of them? And check out the land. Do some soil samples. Is it good land or bad land? Is the soil fertile or, or poor? Are there trees on the land or not? Bring back some of the fruit of the land. What kind of towns do they live in? Are they walled? Are they fortified? Well, the spies came back, and they gave their report, and the report regarding the land could not have been more optimistic. They said, the land is a good land. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. The fruit of the land is in super abundance, but their report about the people of that land could not have been more negative. They said, the people in that land are, are strong. They're stronger than we are. And the cities are protected with great walls. And all the spies said, we cannot take the land. We are not able to go up against them. They are like giants, and we are like grasshoppers. And that report melted the hearts of the people. All but one man, and that one man was Caleb, and Joshua was another, but Caleb had a different take. Caleb had faith. Caleb had an optimistic outlook. Because you see, here's the thing. God had already promised to give Israel this land. And so the question should not have been how high are the walls, how strong are the people, how big are the giants. 
But the only question that needed to be answered was how true are God's promises? How trustworthy is God? And Caleb came back with a completely different interpretation. He said, I believe God. We can do this. We can go up and possess the land. We are well able. And Caleb was right, and the rest of them were wrong. And by the way, the majority is often wrong. And now here he is, up to date, Caleb is 85 years old, 85 years old. He's got his ARP card in one hand and his Social Security card in the other. He's 85. On his last birthday, the candles cost more than the cake. The fire department was called to put out the fire. Those candles contributed to global warming. They were a bonfire. He's 85, and he sounds just like he did when he was 40. He's optimistic in outlook. My friend, attitude is so important, and I think it gets even more important as we get older in life. Attitude to no small degree determines one's quality of life. Attitude determines altitude. What's going on inside of us is more important and carries more weight than what's going on around us. Attitude can make an old person older. An attitude can make an old person young and a young person old. Many times, joy or despair, success or failure, victory or defeat comes down to attitude. How would you describe Caleb's attitude? Well, I would describe him as a man of faith and a man of courage, ready, willing, and able, godly and gutsy. It's quite amazing that his physical strength has not weakened or waned. But the real story, the real story here is the spirit of the man. And at 885, he is optimistic in outlook. And Caleb is not only optimistic in outlook, but he's also aggressive in action. You'd be mistaken to dismiss Caleb as merely a man of words, a delusional old man living in the past. You know, I find the older I get, the greater athlete I was. <laughs> and it won't be long, I'll be the finest shortstop and shooting guard that ever came out of Memphis. My brother-in-law and I had this ongoing debate about who was the faster runner when we were young. And I just texted him a few days ago, and it was the longest text of my life, but it was worth it. I said, hey, we know how fast I could run around the bases, but you never hit the ball far enough to require running past first base. I said, man, I was so fast I could play tennis by myself. I was so fast I would just leave the car in the garage. I was so fast a marathon was a dash. I was so fast... NASA wanted to study me so they could get to the moon faster. I was so fast, there were times I left the room and came back, and you never knew it. I said, I was so fast, Muhammad Ali asked me for my autograph. That's the kind of conversations I have with my brother-in-law. His response was, you're a legend in your own mind. <laughs> So I'm not lying about those recollections. My memory is just a little uh, less accurate these days. That's not the case for Caleb. Caleb recalls with precise and unexaggerated accuracy what he was in the past, what he is in the present, what he can do in the future. He is a force to be contended with. He is a leader. 
He is a model and a mentor to his friends and a menace to his enemies. The old man can still bring it. He's not through with God. God's not through with him. He's old, but he's not out. He's over the hill, but he's ready for another one. He's not brash, but he's bold. He's not conceited, but he is confident. He's not full of self, but he is full of the Spirit. And you better make room for a man or a woman like that. He was a man of faith. Faith in what? Faith in himself? No. Faith in Israel? No. Faith in the Lord's promises. In verse 12, he said, give me this mountain that the Lord promised me that day. His faith is tethered to the Word of God. He knew God's Word would never let him down. He knew that when he was 40. He knows it now when he's 85. That's the kind of people to hang around. And again, this is not a delusional man with dementia. His mind is as sharp as his body is strong. And the fact is, after he is given the land at 85 years of age, he will go into that land and he will expel the giants out of it. The next book, Judges, chapter 1, verse 20 tells us, And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. The Anakins were giants. They were giants in the land. The NIV says he drove them out. Hello. Just another day in the office for Caleb. He drove them out. I don't know how he did it. I don't know if he devised the strategy and others carried it out. I don't know if he personally rolled up his sleeves and bared his 85-year-old muscles and took after them himself or what he did. All I know is he got the job done just like he said he would. Lord, he was optimistic in outlook, and he was aggressive in action. I love a man that embraces life like that. I told the story. I preached a funeral a couple of days ago, Paul Chatham, and I told the story. Paul and Don Poole and I had had lunch a couple of years ago, but Paul was still over 80 years of age at that time, and we had lunch, and after we had lingered in each other's presence, we all went out to our respective cars, and, and I noticed Paul's car was way back on the far side of that parking lot, and, uh, and it was a big parking lot. And I said, Paul, do you, can I drive you over to your car? He said, no, I've got this. And I turned my head and I looked up and he was gone. And he was, he was, he was running, not walking. I mean sprinting, not like an 80-year-old man with bad knees and a bent over back. He was running like an Olympian across that parking lot. I came home and told my wife, as long as I ever live, I'll never forget the image of Paul, over 80 years of age, running across that. I don't know if I could have kept up with him. And I felt like the Lord gave me just a little glimpse into the essence of this man, Paul Chatham. This man embraced life. He embraced it fully and joyfully. I think he embraced it like we all should. And if we can't do it physically, we can sure do it spiritually and emotionally. Yes, Caleb was optimistic in outlook. He was aggressive in action. Thirdly, I would like to note that he was rewarded in retirement. Yeah, he got his inheritance. He got it all. Now, he had to wait. He had to wait a long time, a long time. In fact, he had to go through the rigors of 40 years in a desert. He had to wait and wait. But finally his day came. Finally he got his reward. That is presented to us here in verse 13. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, gave him Hebron as his inheritance. And Hebron has belonged to Caleb ever since because he followed 
the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. And by the way, three times that little phrase is attached to Caleb, he followed the Lord wholly. The one time is from Caleb, another time is from Moses, and the third time, believe it or not, is from God Himself in the book of Numbers, verse 24, and, uh, four, chapter 14, verse 24, God said, My servant Caleb hath followed me wholly. Without the Lord, we are an irrelevant farce, and with the Lord, we're an irresistible force. Without the Lord, we have nothing and we can do nothing. With the Lord, we have everything and we can do anything. Without the Lord, giants dominate our land. With the Lord, we drive the giants away. Without the Lord, we are faithless, feckless, and fruitless. But with the Lord, we possess the land and everything in it. And you may be serving the Lord through the most difficult of circumstances. You may have served the Lord for decades, and you feel like, I'm still waiting for my rewards. Where are the rewards? You may be derided and dismissed, scorned and scoffed, ridiculed and written off because of your faith, but your reward is there, and your reward is coming. If God is anything, He is a rewarder. The Bible says, they that come to Him must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. My spell check uh, doesn't even have the word rewarder. It says, uh, it says that word doesn't exist, but my spell check doesn't know God. But people who know God know that He is a rewarder. You say, well, I'm a Christian, and I don't seem to have much going, going on in the way of rewards. I can barely pay my bills. My body struggles with weakness and sickness. I have unbelieving relatives and neighbors who seem to be more rewarded than I am in this life. Yeah, but wait. Wait just a bit. Wait just a little longer. Caleb waited a long time. You may not get it all in this life, but you will get the full reward. How do I know? <laughs> Bible tells me so. Where does it tell me? Jump in anywhere. Paul, James, Peter, Jude, and yes, Jesus. You may be wondering, you know, why, why do you talk about heaven and hope and death and dying? Why do you talk about that? You seem to talk about it a lot. Well, I can tell you why. Because death is something we all have in common. Every one of us will face it. Last time I checked, the death rate is 100% for the human race. And it really doesn't matter who's in office, by the way. I don't care what they promise. I'm surprised one of them hasn't promised yet. When I get into office, nobody dies. Death is no respecter of persons. Check the obituary page. You'll see rich and poor and male and female and young and old and people of all colors and all origins in the obituary column. It's appointed unto man once to die. None of us get out of here alive. We all have the inevitability of that appointment that awaits us. Why do I talk about it? Because if we don't, if the church doesn't, who will? And who should be talking about it if not the church? Shall we leave it to the atheist or the materialist or the fatalist or the futilist who see no meaning in life or death? Why do I talk about it? Because the Bible speaks about it. From Genesis to Revelation, from patriarch to psalmist, from prophet to apostle, and nobody talks about it more than our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So I'm in good company when I talk about our hope and our rewards. Jesus spoke about it so beautifully, so intimately in a little story tucked away easily and often overlooked in Luke chapter 16, the story of a rich man and a poor man. And the rich man, it says, 
It says of his end, it's simply described like this, the rich man died and was buried. There's a sad and certain finality to it all. To it all. And when his time was up, his wealth and his influence and his social standing couldn't beg, borrow, or barter one more minute. In geographical proximity to that rich man, there was a beggar. In fact, he was laid at the rich man's gate where he begged for bread. While the rich man fared sumptuously, while he lived luxuriously, Outside his ornate door, the beggar begged, the hungry man hungered, the sick man suffered, the dying man died. But despite that poor man's lack of wealth and fame, he was one of God's saints. Sometimes God's saints are hidden. And when he died, Jesus described it this way, Angels came and carried him into his rest and his reward, carried him into the presence of God. And Jesus used words of great tenderness and intimacy to describe the transfer of one of his children from this life into the next life. So, yes, Caleb got his reward. This cold-hearted, self-centered rich man got his reward, and so did this God-fearing man. He didn't get it in this life, but he got his reward, and so will we, so will we. And if I may, from Friday's final words in behalf of Paul Chatham, one of the finest Christian gentlemen I've ever known. No one could contest that he was a man of honesty and integrity through and through. I admired and respected Paul for many, many years. And here's the way I concluded my thoughts at his funeral. I said, my imagination takes me back a few days, a few days ago. I, a celestial construction crew finished a new home. A lovely home. Upon completion, Jesus came by for the final inspection. And the curious crew inquired about the name of the person who would be living in this new home. Jesus looked down toward earth and he saw Paul. And Paul was weak, which he rarely was. And he was worn, which he rarely was. And he was ready, which he always was. And Jesus said, this mansion is for one of my servants. He served me faithfully for many years. Put a little extra gold in there. Add some more jewels. And when it was all ready, the nod was given, and the heavenly escort came down, and they ushered Paul Chatham into heaven to live forever in his new home where there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. I hope you have that hope. I hope you have the hope of heaven. Let's pray. Father, without you, without your Son, nothing seems to make any sense, not life and not death. You are the missing ingredient that makes sense of it all. No wonder your word so powerfully proclaims, by him all things are held together. A mind and a, a man held together by his creator and by his judge. Oh, Father, if there are those here today that, that are not living with the assurance of this hope, I pray today that the miracle will happen, the miracle of enlightenment, of revelation, of conversion, 
the miracle that is so unforgettably defined in your word, the miracle of being born again. And I pray that you, by your sovereign spirit, will speak to every heart today. It cannot be by the manipulation of man, but by the mercy of God that we come to an understanding of the only thing that makes sense. I pray you today, Lord, you will reveal your grace and your mercy to one and all.